Welcome back to Your Average Witch, where every Tuesday we talk about witch life, witch stories, and sometimes a little witchcraft. Your Average Witch is brought to you by Crepuscular Conjuration. If you've been disappointed that the waitlist for bee boxes mostly stays closed, I have a fun surprise for you. Sabbat boxes. I'm going to offer 10 boxes for four sabbats each year. It won't be for every sabbat because that's basically every month, which is already what bee boxes are. So I'm just doing them for my favorites. Beltane, Lunaza, Samhain, and Yule. Each box is $50, which includes shipping in the U.S., and will be worth at least $75 if purchased individually. Your box will have a variety of things I make, like altar cloths, pendulums, pendulum boards, offering dishes, candles, crystals, a seasonally appropriate spell, a piece of Clever Kim's Curios jewelry, plus tea and a snack, because as I keep saying, your girl is a Taurus, and a few other little surprises. Up first is Lunazon. Sales are open now, and your box will ship the week before the holiday. There are only 10 boxes available. Visit CleverKimsCurios.com to buy yours. This week, I'm talking with my friend Darlena Marie, whom I've known for nearly 15 years. We talk about cultural appropriation, cultural appreciation, and how movement can be magic for your body and soul. Now let's get to the stories. Darlena, welcome Yay! to the show! <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to talk to you finally on this, this computer instead of on Marco. I know, but soon we'll be in person. <sighs> Can you please introduce yourself and let everybody know who you are and what you do and where they can find you? Sure. Hi, everybody. I am Darlena Marie, a.k.a. Chula Sparks, and I am a fire and fusion burlesque performer as well as a jewelry artist from El Paso, Texas. Eee, and my Yay. old teacher. And your Actually, old teacher. My current teacher. Yeah. Oh, I am your current teacher. That's right. That is right. Head on over to Crepuscular Conjuration and join join the the package. What do you call it? The Patreon. No, Patreon? Well, or no. get a fucking subscription. <laughs> <laughs> get a subscription and I will give you poi lessons via Marco Polo. There we go. But also, Darlena, tell people where they can find you to buy things from you. So, I am still a little hidden. So most of my shoppers either purchase from me via Facebook or Instagram or live at markets if you're in El Paso and I happen to be at a market. So on Instagram, I post five items, I'm sorry, 10 items a day that are currently available still. And if you see something you like, you just message me and you can pay virtually. And if you are in El Paso, I will deliver to your doorstep. If not, it's just an extra $5 shipping charge for anyone in the US. And um, I usually get them out the next day. And then I post a lot of sales too. And on like Facebook, things on sale. Is oh, it Dragon's Oh, on Lab Facebook. Embellishments? I do have a Facebook page for Dragon's Lab embellishments, but it's uh it, nobody really uses it, which is fine. I, I've made a few sales ever on there. Um, I think also that Facebook made changes and it was really hard to update what is on that page. So mm -hmm. um Mostly just on my Facebook, if you message me first and let me know you're not a weirdo, scary person, I will accept your friendship request. And uh, you can shop my Facebook album or see all of my Instagram posts that transfer onto there every day. So you can find me on Facebook at uh, Darlena Marie and on Instagram at Darlena Marie 915. Now, would you please tell everyone what it means to you when you call yourself a witch? So, I've thought extensively about this question because I listen to your podcast. And um, the reason it's an unusual question for me is I never officially first called myself a witch. Everyone else did. So, um, I've been able, I am a medium 
by inheritance, not by practice. So I actually don't even do much with it. But spirits have always visited me since I was a little kid. And uh, I would tell everyone about it all the time. Um, And uh, some people believe me. My mother uh, is very supportive and has always believed me. But I made the mistake as a little kid to tell other little kids because I'm an oversharer. And so people who didn't like me growing up started calling me witch as an insult um, because of that gift. And um, I got called that through elementary school, middle school, and high school. Um, And I don't know. I never took it as an insult. I didn't feel bad about it. Um, But I never... Um, until later in life actually like owned the word and was like, yeah, I'm a fucking witch. So what? So, um, it was kind of, um, it was kind of given to me more than me calling myself that. And to me, honestly, when I hear other people call themselves witches, but it's not necessarily the same thing. Cause I think that a lot, I think everyone has capability of a third eye gift, um, but whether we choose to acknowledge it and um, work it out like the muscle that it is or try to ignore it and glue it shut is it depends on the person and um, how much we're influenced by society and our surroundings. Uh, but to me, really, a witch is anyone who has their own spiritual practices that do not conform to Western religious norms and beliefs um, and who try to work out their third eye gift, whatever that is. So you mentioned that this was an an inherited thing. Does anybody else in your family have anything like this? Do they do you have any stories from childhood of witchy, weird, occult, paranormal, metaphysical, whatever word you want to choose to describe it, things? Oh, all the stories. There's so many stories. But um I did find out just in the last few years that there are a few of my cousins that also um, have this blessing. Um, So my gift of interacting with spirits was passed down to me and a few of my cousins by my great grandma Blasa, um, which is on my maternal side, who was a Catholic curandera. And my great grandparents had migrated over from um, Coyame, Mexico. And they had my great grandfather ha- built with his own hands this little house in Sierra Blanca, Texas, is where they settled. Um, and so that little house is actually still there. My uh, family still owns it collectively. Um, but there have been so many stories from my aunts, uncles, and uh, all of my mom's cousins, who I call my aunts and uncles, they don't really call them cousins. Um, Uh, various stories from that town and that house, some scary, some, some really nice ones. But um, yeah, we've, we grew up hearing the stories. Um, So there's a lot of them. And yeah, a few of my cousins are able to interact with the spirits of people who have passed on as well and the energies. Will you tell me a story? (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) I got to think. Let's see. So let's see what's, um, what's one of my favorite stories from back then. So, um, one of the things was, um, and I, I know this is actually kind of a common like occurrence of seeing people with animal feet and that being like demons coming to get you kind of thing. So my uncle, one of my uncles has like um, a checkered past, I guess. And uh, he was fighting with my grandma one day out there in Sierra Blanca, not my great grandmother, but my grandmother. Um, This is my uncle, my mom's brother. And he was going to go everywhere in Sierra Blanca you can walk to. It's a very little town. If you blink when you're passing it on I-10, you miss it. There's, um, I swear, only like a few hundred people live there. It's probably a little more. 
but it's got to be under a thousand. Um, and so there's one school for the whole town, no stoplights, and you can pretty much walk everywhere. So they used to have a really cool little movie theater. And there is a cut through uh, t- from my great grandparents' house to the movie theater. They call it the tank because it used to, f- it was a big ditch that would fill with water and the kids would swim in it back then or catch frogs. Um, and there was a little bridge that went over the tank. And, um, my uncle was crossing, went, I think he wasn't, my grandma didn't want him to go out if I remember the story correctly. And he was like, I'm going anyway. So he went and on his way home, he was by himself walking through the tank and there was someone coming towards him that he didn't recognize. It was a really big, um, figure, really tall with, uh, you know, like a, um, a hat that was covering their head and a trench coat. And he just thought, because people at, in that town, there's no curfew. People walk around at whatever time they want. So he just thought it was someone drunk or, you know, on their way somewhere else. So he would move as, as this person got closer coming in the opposite direction of him coming towards him. Um, he would move to the side to kind of make room for them to pass. And the, the, um, figure moved with him as it moved. It didn't move after him. He would move and it would move to the side and he would move and it would move to the other side. And he was like, this is, this is I hate it. starting. I hate it. Yes. <laughs> so as he got closer, it stopped abruptly right in front of him. And he looked down cause he was talking to it like who, Hey, you need help or something wrong. Can I help you? And he, my uncle was very like, Chingon very like he fought a lot he thought he was really cool and I don't remember if this was before or after he came back from um, w- the war but he looked down he used to not be scared of anything he looked down and it had uh, giant chicken feet, the feet I hate were this chicken very feet. much <laughs> yeah sorry <laughs> and he just pushed past it and ran back home and this my mom continues the story that when him and my grandmother were arguing I'm not quite sure what my grandmother said but she was mad at him and she said something I don't know if she cursed him like literally cursed not not a real curse or a hex but like I don't know said something to him and that my great grandmother had told my grandma like you, you're not supposed to say things like that to your kids uh he had other entities other darker entities throughout his life come and visit him. Um, but that one always sat with us. And there was one time I was at a club in college in Dallas and it was packed. It was super packed and everyone was dancing. And I dropped um, my little coin purse that I was holding with my money and my, and my um, ID. And I leaned down to get it on the dance floor. It's tons of feet. And then I saw pig feet, <gasps> giant pig feet. And I freaked out and I stood up and I looked back down and I'm like, there's, they weren't there anymore, but I left. <laughs> that shit was scary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh my God. I would die. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the chicken feet man is what we called it. And it, that was still one of the scarier stories, but they're not all scary stories. Obviously I'm not afraid of that was to me, not an, not a entity that it was used to be a human. That was not a spirit that I think was a human ever. I think that was something else. Um, but yeah, the human spirits that visit me pretty regularly don't scare me the way they might scare other people. So I have a culture question for you. Sure. You have seen reservation dogs, right? Yes. So do you think Dear Lady is an accurate description of like how they come to be and who they are? Um, I think yes, for in some cases. Like, um, there are a lot of hurt spirits that don't aren't able to cross over into the ancestral realm um to to go to the next level of what it is you know we do um and they're either hurt or angry um there's a lot of reasons why spirits get stuck here and um and some of them 
want to be stuck here. Some of them thrive off of the fear that they, you know, instill in human beings. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's one of the many ways that they can get stuck here. However, I believe uh, Dear Woman was actually a, a human at some point, right? If I mm-hmm. remember that correctly. Yeah. Um, but for this particular, um, s- this entity, I don't believe that one. Because um, from some of the stories I've heard and, r- and some of the things I've read, um, typically the chicken feet and the, the pig hooves are of not anything that was ever human. Chickens and pigs are freaking scary, dude. They will eat you. Yes. Deer won't, but a woman will. I mean, not a woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a woman will gobble you right up. <laughs> Go ahead. Test us. <laughs> Cross me and find out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Chicken will fucking eat you. We are lucky they're not huge. Yeah. That's why that's scary because. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Chicken feet are fucking scary if you stare at them long enough. And pigs scare the shit out of me. Yeah. Both of those things will eat you given a chance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on that positive note, can you introduce us to your personal practice? <laughs> Do you have any consistent things that you do? I know of some. I do um, have a few consistent things. Um, on the daily, I work with, I know that um, talking to a lot of different witches, there are different candles used for different things. Um, I actually only work with white candles. Scented or unscented doesn't matter. Unless it's vanilla, throw it in the trash, then I don't want it because that shit gives me a headache. Um <laughs> But I light a, and I go through white candles like like you wouldn't believe because I light a white candle every morning as I get ready for whatever my day is supposed to be to set intention. And um, and then uh, sometimes when I come home, if there's a little bit more work I want to do to send good energy out to someone, I light the candle again or even for myself. So that is a small daily practice. Um as well as movement. I try to, so to me, my magic has a lot to do with empowerment, um, movement, body magic. And so I try to do, I try to dance a little jig every day uh, to generate some good energy and send it out through my feet and uh, through my heart. And so those are things I do regularly every day. And then over the full moon, uh, I do practice fire once a week, but I make sure to also get it done on a full moon unless weather does not permit. Then that's when I'll do more stuff inside, like salt baths. Uh, but the fire and the moon are my favorite thing in the whole wide world. I just did it yesterday. Um, and I it will was lovely. rehearse. What was that? It was lovely. Oh, thank you. I do fire practice and fire dance to the moon and it just so happens that the house we are in now that we are renting to own is was actually picked for us by the person who flipped it uh so i didn't realize until one day a friend of mine who i used to do a lot of spoken word with came over to pick up a jewelry order and i had already been for five, at least 5 or 6 years doing fire in my driveway i do it for the halloween i put on a show for the kids any kids who want to come watch um but just regularly practicing and he walked up and he says holy shit holy shit you live at a crossroads and i do i live at a four way four way cross two stop signs uh, and i was like yeah and he goes that's some hecate shit right there and i was like Oh, it is, isn't it? And I didn't even pick this house. This house picked me. And I'm like, I guess it is. But at the time that he brought it up to me, I didn't know that I had heard of Hecate. Uh, And I say it probably all kinds of wrong. But um, I started reading more about her. And there's just a lot of parallels with uh, the underworld, fire and torches, Mm -hmm. my familiar is my little dog uh, Bowser and she's a black dog 
and uh, and then the four way the four way cross. I live right at it. So now I consciously do when I start my practice. I address uh, the four directions, and um, like yesterday, if I have a chance and, and there's no cars coming, I will stand in the middle of the crossroad and uh, address the four directions with my fire. My neighbors must fucking love me. <laughs> They're probably all watching out their window. There goes that lady know. again. Yep. There's that crazy lady across the street. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who needs who needs an alarm system when you instilled the fear of bruja in your neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> My neighbors are lovely, most of them. The ones I know anyway. How has witchcraft changed your life? So it's been part of my life since as far back as I can remember, as far as the medium mediumship goes. Um, so that in that sense, it hasn't really changed it. And actually, when I started doing like full moon rituals, any type of cleansings on myself and in my personal space or to people I love, I've always asked my ancestors for guidance. It's, and that's always just been a natural thing. Um, I, I, I have always channeled my ancestors. Um, and so I didn't know, like, I didn't know it was a thing or, you know, until I don't know how long it's been now, maybe 10 years or a little more that witchcraft has now become pretty popular. And there's a lot more conversation about ancestors. There's a lot more conversation overall about different third eye capabilities. And so with that movement, it's a double-edged sword because there's a whole lot of people who are not, I don't know what the word is. Like they're just trying to make a quick buck and they don't really believe in any of it. Um, mm -hmm. Then, but there's the a equivalent whole lot of, of Jimmy Swaggart. Yes. Yes. So there's a whole lot of people who have found their power, their third eye gift and embraced it. And I stopped being weird. So what was cool to me, uh, what I have been happy about is that the word witch really stopped being an insult. Mm -hmm. And so a word that was thrown at me and called me called or what was I was called when I was a kid as an insult became like this really cool thing to be. And I'm like here for it. I'm just sitting here like, oh, yeah, now who's yeah, now you want to be a witch, huh? Like, so the, I wouldn't say witchcraft has changed my life because what people called me a witch for has always been a part of my life. But the fact that witchcraft is so, um, so much more embraced now has changed my life, I think for the better, because I've been able to connect with a lot more people and talk about it more openly. Um, without feeling like someone's and yeah people are still gonna think I'm weird I don't really care about that but I feel like you just connect with a lot more people um more openly and I feel a lot safer in a lot of different spaces now sharing it that's what it is I wasn't worried about being viewed as weird I was worried about someone Physical trying to injury <laughs> yes absolutely assault yes mm-hmm what is the bit? What's the biggest motivator in your practice, and has it changed since you first started? Um. So the biggest motivator in my practice um, used to be, and is one of them still, but not not all the way. Uh, was just I had the privilege and the luxury of being connected to people who have passed on that I missed. Um, I didn't have to miss them. It, I miss them still, but in a different way, but I still get the luxury of interacting with them. The only thing I will say is since this was not on purpose, I'm not even going to pretend like I know how to use it. Like I don't, they come to me and sometimes I don't even know who the spirits are who are visiting me. I don't have any, I don't know how to use that or how to control it. I have been offered by several other mediums to learn, but I kind of like the surprise visits. So <laughs> mine is not a service. I'm not providing anyone a service. I just kind of uh, like that I get to see. And a lot of the people, like one of my favorite cousins 
who I grew up with, she died when she was 18. I was in college uh, in a car, very, very tragic car accident. She still to this day visits me pretty often. Um, but I will say because my parents tried so hard to assimilate, especially my dad, I am fourth generation American on my mom's side, first generation on my dad's side. Um, he did migrate over from Mexico. They didn't really teach me um, like about Dia de los Muertos. I actually learned that through my community and that helped me to create my altar and creating my altar has made it a lot easier to communicate or channel the p the spirits that I was close to. Um, otherwise, like I can't help it. I can't help who, who wants to come and interact with me. So um, yeah, that was initially my practice that I didn't even know I was practicing, but what I've really come into power, um, what my guides have told me over the years, uh, is my magic to give to other people is not actually my mediumship. It's, um, empowerment of body and, um, love, self-love. You'd be amazed at how much of our power is found or discovered within just really self-acceptance and self-love and um, helping to generate better energy that way and give it out to the rest of the world. And so I've been able to, to do that through dance and movement. Um, and when I'm doing that with the fire, the fire is just my favorite element to heighten it, but uh, I do it with or without the fire. So um, I have been able to take the power back aside from which uh, in a lot of words that were used to hurt me. Um, so there was witch, fat, slut. Uh, yeah, we, I've learned to take the power in these words and, um, instead of be sad because I'm getting called that really use it, put it on a t-shirt and fucking wear it around while I do witch shit and people, it drives people nuts, but it gives me the power back. I can't change like the uh, the word itself, but I can change what it means to me. And so that's actually my real craft um, is empowerment through myself, through my body and to gift that to other people. One of the biggest things that I re remember when you first came into the Margot group is that you were introducing yourself to everybody and you said that you like yourself and you like your body and you were you were open about it and people really don't like that and I thought that's my friend <laughs> yeah and I've kind of always except when I was like a little teenager and I've always been thick a thick a thick curvy person and um people had tried to hurt me a lot growing up with fat jokes and fat and I would cry about it. But then I got to a point where I was like, I would look in the mirror and I really dug myself. I was like, man, this ain't bad. I don't understand what the problem is. And uh, I would say from about 16 year old on, I was, I owned it. I have owned it ever since. And yes, there have been points in my life where I, maybe I was a little bit slimmer, but really I've always been, curvy and thick. And, uh, at any size I have really dug myself. Like I, I have, I don't know what it's like to look in the mirror and all the way just despise myself. I don't know what that's like. And I know there's a whole lot, there's not a whole lot of people that know what that feels like. And it occurred to me as I started becoming a dance teacher and meeting people of all sizes and shapes and colors, whatever you think perfect is, I've been, I've met the perfect people and they're, they have issues. Everyone has issues. And I'm sitting here like, y'all look great. I look great. Let's look great together. Like I have just, and so I learned that it is a gift to really and truly accept and like yourself. And I, however I can help other people to do that, because seriously, that is a huge step. And so many less people have the capability to hurt you if you are unfazed and just really do love yourself. So yeah, um, 
been using my my body and my slut powers for good for most of my life. And I say slut powers because I'm in burlesque and there are people who will try to call you slutty for it. Let them. I raise a lot of money for a lot of charities through burlesque. So they can, they can die mad about it. That's fine. That's my favorite thing when they have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Another culture question that I would not ask other guests, but you know that I am why I'm asking and who I am and that I'm not a dick. Yeah. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked about your altar and your ancestors. Um, is that an of- ofrenda or is that yes. something else? It's only for Dia de los uh, Muertos. Ofrenda and altar are pretty much the same thing, but during Dia de los Muertos, um, you do leave offerings. You can other times too, but it's real big. Oh my God, that's not good. <laughs> Sorry. Did you hear that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Son of a, okay. Yeah, you can't, during Dia de los Muertos, um, yes, you leave specific offerings on different days because um, it is, it's three days. Um, so there's days when you leave specific things for the spirits of children. Um, and then for, you know, your elders and, um, sometimes there it's bread, there's flowers, it's food, whole food, salt. Um, I like to leave, um, my dad's favorite beer on my altar for him. Cause my dad passed away when I was 25. Um, so I leave a lot for him. Um, so yeah, you specifically do leave stuff on your ofrenda for your, for Dia de los Muertos. And there's a lot of people who only set it up for those three days. Um, and then there's a lot of different people who leave it up all year, but do those specific, um, offerings on those days and put the specific flowers. Um, what's the flower? What is the flower, Kim? Oh my gosh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Is that the no? Is that or marigolds? Is that what they're marigolds? Thank you, thank you. My brain would not find the word. Would specifically put marigolds for that time. Um, So there are specific things you can put on your ofrenda, your your altar at Dia de los Muertos. Otherwise, you can leave it up all year. Um, I know people can't see me here, but you can, and it's back there behind me to your right. Um, so yeah, um, Dia de los Muertos is, uh, more of a ritual. And what I love about Dia de los Muertos is, uh, you can, I can feel, I'm sure other mediums can feel the presence of the spirits way more than a regular day or a regular time of year because so many people are channeling their ancestors and putting up their altars and leaving offerings for them. That shit gets really powerful and I can really feel all the spirits all around uh, in anywhere I go. Um, so yeah, the other los Muertos. I live for the month of October from, from the, my, my birthday is at the end of September. So for those six weeks from my birthday to the first, the first three days in November, that is my jam. That is my time of year. That is when I feel my most powerful also because I feel the spirits, uh, so much more strongly than any other time of year. And now it's going to start in September. Your favorite part of the year is going to start in September. Oh yeah, I am very, then, yeah, it's just gonna, it's just gonna (laughs) tack onto it. I am very excited, very, very excited about all that. I'm going, I'm telling everyone, I'm going to Anahata's purpose. And I don't know if I'm allowed to call it what I call it, but you know what I call it. Call whatever you want. I I call it the Grand Witch's Retreat. (laughs) (laughs) Because some of my favorite um, witches go there, like you, Kim. Eee, I can't wait to see you there. I can't wait for you to visit eee. me because I want to see what my my land tells you. Oh, man. I'm excited for that, too. And I'm just excited to hang with you in person again. So the world has no idea. So let's tell them. Kim found me when she lived in El Paso for a little bit. And we both used to belly dance. She Googled 
the style of belly dance in El Paso and my name was one of the first ones to pop up for classes. And so Kim joined my class and I think this was in 2011, 2012? 2011. We've been friends ever since. Yep. And for people who don't know, it's basically a lead and style form of belly dance that got really popular in the late 1990s, early 2000s in California. And it took the U.S. and actually the world by storm. Um, And uh, we were some of the people it took by storm. Um, It's a very lovely craft. However... Over the last five, six years, we have discovered all of the problematic stuff within that, within general American belly dance and how it is harmful sometimes to um, marginalize people that we are borrowing from in the cultural dances. And so um, one example for everyone listening is belly dance is such a blanket term. It's almost... It's almost an ignorant blanket term because it's encompassing so many groups of people and heritages and cultures. And the U.S. doesn't know that. They just think it's one thing. And it's actually hundreds Mm -hmm. of groups of people. So it's more, it's better when you can actually identify the cultural dance as what it is it is called with the cultural group of people it comes from. So belly dance is not one big giant dance culture thing that the rest of the world calls it. It's actually a huge problematic blanket term for a lot of, um, for a lot of specific cultural dances that were passed down to people uh, within their families and generations of their families. So That is why I don't call what I do specifically belly dance anymore. I do use my isolation um, dancing in my performance, both in burlesque and in um, fire performing. But I do not. And it looks like belly dance because I had 17 years of training in quote unquote belly dance. But I don't want to market it as a cultural dance. I do not want to feed into the Orientalism of uh, or the gimmick of what American belly dance sometimes does. So I just call it body isolation because I, too, was not learning or teaching the specific rhythms, the specific uh, root cultures in some of the movements that I was teaching back when I was teaching. I no longer teach. Um, So uh, I did not know some of the histories on some of those cultures. And so those things are important when you start trying to actually market your performing art as a cultural performing art. Then I think anyone in any type of art doing that kind of thing, if you're not of that culture, you need to immerse yourself and learn everything you can about that culture to pay respect and give back to the culture and the people you are borrowing from. What would you say is the biggest motivator in your practice and has it changed since you first started out? So the biggest motivator was um, was staying connected to my um, spirit guides and ancestors just to stay like sane, you know, growing pains and growing up and um, just having some form of guidance. But now I feel so firm in that guidance. I feel so strong in that, that, um, that's when I felt like my actual gift that my ancestors are teaching me to utilize and give to everyone else is, uh, empowerment through body, through movement, through self-acceptance, self-love and self-awareness. And so, um, just like, you found me in dance and I have now connected to so many other people and um, which is through dance, through movement. Um, So my motivation now more than it being for me to just stay, you know, to make it through this life uh, with my ancestors on my side is now more to help other people do that um, through self-acceptance and love. So Yay. It shifted from being selfish, <laughs> I guess, or being not selfish because then people think of it as a as a bad thing. But being for myself, I has now sh- I have now shifted it to being not just for myself. I got me, I got me in there still, but 
how do I help the rest of the world uh, through this fucking shithole we call humanity, right? Yeah, so that's that's what that has changed to. Cool. You look extra pretty right now. What did you do? I'm wearing my very magical necklace by Clever Kim's Curios. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but I make your face so pretty. <laughs> Well, it's making my whole face, like, it's lighting the whole thing up. I actually did not do anything different, except I will say this. My moon practice last night was for almost three hours. I was out there jamming with her. My body hurt. My shoulders wanted to fall off. My arms were mad. My wrists were mad. I didn't care, though. I was feeling it. Um, And I woke up feeling so badass this morning. I felt so good. So I think I still have the glow. Yeah, maybe last night you inspired me. I went out, even though I got blisters on my weed weeding hand, <laughs> where where I hold the things. The poor yeah. I went outside and I spun under the moon too with you. So that was fun. Yay, yay! I can't tell you how happy it makes me that we are again sharing energy and power through movement. Yeah. Hmm. I love that. What is your biggest struggle when it comes to your practice? Um, energy, having the energy. I find now as not, I don't want to say as I get older, because it's, it's not so, I don't think it's attributed so much to an aging body. I mean, yes, a little bit. But it's just more to your life it, that changes as yes, you age. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Like all of the problems that come with, I mean, Rent. being a human, <laughs> yes, being a human being is rough. We got so much to worry about, even when we're not really worried. We really are worried. You know what I mean? The best mm-hmm. way I can describe it is like this existence is exhausting because no matter what you do for yourself, uh, like the bare minimum of eating and sleeping and drinking water, it's never enough. You'll always need more. You'll always need more air, more water, more sleep. And that is exhausting to think about. And then you get older. You gotta and pee all the time. You gotta pee. Maybe you gotta I don't do... feel like it right now. But yeah, you gotta, gotta babysit it. this freaking, you know, goddess suit. Yeah. So um that is a lot in itself. And then there's worries that come with that as you get older. Like every little pain or bump, you're like, am I dying? Is this, is this it? This is how I go. What is this bump here? Or what is this rash here? Or what is this? And then like, um, the, 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 you got global warming, you got wars, you got mass shootings, you got rent, you got the laundry, you've got to make dinner. Like all of those little stressors really, really, really pile on. Um, and it makes it hard to, uh, support the weight under the gravity of this existence. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's hard. I forgot the question. <laughs> I was too busy talking about all the Your biggest things. struggle. My biggest struggle. Being a human. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Continuing to swim, right? Uh, no. Oh my God. Keeping my third eye open. Uh, I find with all these stresses, and as I've gotten older, because of these stresses and the weight of these stresses, I, so before when I, I, I used to, okay, when I was younger, I saw all the spirits wide awake, wide open, extra people. I, it took me a while to figure out I was seeing extra people that nobody else could see. And then as I got into late teens and uh, early twenties, most of what I would see is, was through dreams and I would dream so many times a night, so many spirits, so many visits, I would dream and dream and dream and remember a lot of those when I woke up. Now I dream a lot. I know I am. I feel that I am. But a lot of the time I will wake up not remembering. I'll know the dream have happened, but I won't remember. And that makes me very sad. Uh, And it's mostly because my, my brain goes to sleep worrying about the human existence stresses. And when I wake up, I'm still worried about those. You know what I mean? So um, it clouds the dreams that I can remember, not all the time, but a lot of the time, because before I could remember my dreams, no problem, constantly, every night, every day, 
several of them. So that is the thing I struggle with the most is trying to still nurture this gift, nurture my third eye while still trying to be a well-balanced human being and survive and take good care of myself and brush my teeth and go to the doctor and shit like that. I wake up mad that I'm still a person every yeah. day, <laughs> every morning. Fuck. Yeah. Fuck. We're still yeah. doing this. Yep. 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 Uh, this is, We're I don't think here. I, this is, I don't think this is what I agreed to when I signed that going right. to earth well, as a person thing. <laughs> exactly. Well, my, one of my best friends, uh, Brittany, put it in perspective one time and I, it has stuck with me. She said, uh, it was when um, all of the talks, because I'm in Texas and Texas is not my favorite um, because I have less rights as a human being. Um, but when we were having this whole debate, um, she said, first of all, I did not give anybody permission to give me this life. I just got thrown in here. True. And then she said, nobody asked me if I wanted to be a woman. I didn't give permission for that. I just got thrown in here as a woman. So, you know, the, the rights that I am trying to fight for, um, like, fuck, you, you gotta already, you gotta fight for that. You gotta fight for that, you know, and you didn't give permission for that here. So, and, and we say all the time, it's not like, I've said this to other people and they look at me like, oh my gosh, are you going to go jump off of something? And it's like, no, I am here. I'm fucking here. I'm going to do the best goddamn job I can because I'm already here. I'm just saying I did not ask to be here. Uh, someone else decided that they wanted me here. So here I am doing my very best and helping others to hopefully do their very best as well. To everyone saying, no, you signed a spirit contract and this is what you chose. You chose this life when you were in the prequel of life. Okay. But what if we didn't? <laughs> we don't know. So just let us have this little chat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just let me vent a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I'm going to have to ask everybody when I get over there. Exactly. I'm not trying to get over there right away. I have a lot left to do here. In yeah, this I still want to go to Anahata's, so problem. not yet. Yeah. <laughs> I still got to go to the Grand Witches Retreat, guys. And I plan to go more than once, so fuck. Yeah, you know, there's still a lot of work we got to get done here, Kim. So I am not trying to jump off of anything, but I'm not going to ignore that this is rough, also. I'm not going to yeah. pretend like it's not. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of our magic is helping people to survive through what's left, what goodness is left for us to really um, focus on, enhance, and encourage. Do you have imposter syndrome? And if you do, what do you do? I have thought about this question a lot, too, from just hearing you ask some of your other guests. And I have Im I have had imposter syndrome for so many things, especially when I was a quote unquote belly dancer. And I was trying so hard to be a belly dancer. And I would have imposter syndrome all the time uh, with good reason. And I knew it was probably because I wasn't learning the things I should have been learning. Uh, my teachers weren't teaching me those things. Um, I've had imposter syndrome for other things in my life. Belly dance was a big one, but I never have imposter syndrome when it comes to my third eye craft. And that's because I didn't fucking call myself a witch in the first place. Uh, so there's that. And like, sure. I even have like, I have an uncle who gives me the side eye every time I start talking about spirits. I don't talk about it very often because half my family believes me and encourages me and half of them are like, you're full of shit. Um, so I don't care. Um, you can believe me if you want. Uh, you don't have to believe me. I know what the fuck I see every day. I know what the fuck I dream. I remember most of the time. I don't have anything to prove to anybody. Uh, so therefore, when it comes to this... I don't have imposter syndrome because this is me just living my authentic life. And uh, I'm not trying to, to force it on anybody else. 
but should it be something that inspires or touches someone else, well then they're welcome to come along. And if they don't believe me, uh, again, they can die mad because I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for me. That makes me happy. That's the answer, everyone. You aren't, you don't have to prove shit to those people. To nobody, really, no. Especially anyone practicing a third eye practice. Don't have, try not to have imposter syndrome. If it's really a craft you're doing for yourself and you're just sharing for who anybody, anybody who is open and wants to learn and share in your craft. Otherwise, fuck them. I mean, yeah, some of you have to sell it's a business. That's fine. But you don't have to sell that hard. Those aren't your people then. That's not your audience. That's not the people who want to learn and grow with you. And that's fine. Let them move on their merry way. Imposter syndrome. Um, it's kind of like, uh, you know how people say, if you have shit to say about me, say it to my face, right? I don't give a shit. Don't say it to my face. Cause if I want you to say it to my face, that means I care what you have to say. And I really, frankly, don't have a fucking care about what you have to say to me. So I'm not proving nothing to you. So that's the kind of the same line. Like don't say it. I say it to the wall, say it somewhere else. I give a fuck what you have to say about me or your opinions. You know what I mean? Like in general, people who like have shitty things to say, well, fucking swallow it, choke on it. And I can't say this enough. Die mad about it. Because I'm not going to die with you. I've got shit to do. <laughs> that makes me happy. <laughs> I guess the, the, the moral of the story is give fewer fucks. Yes. Give fewer fucks. And you will not suffer from as much imposter syndrome. Now, the other thing I will say that is important, though, is... Um, Imposter syndrome is important to keep us in check. If you are, again, I can't say this enough. I just can't say this enough. And I'll probably say this a few more times. If you're trying to borrow culturally from a culture that is not yours, then that's where imposter syndrome can help you stay in check. I agree. I am going to take a class on voodoo. Oh, given by someone who is fucking words are gone culture. out of my fucking yeah. head. <laughs> yeah. A source practitioner. Yes, yes. That's what I, yeah, that's what we call those. Lord, like, that one. <laughs> practitioners. Mm -hmm. Good. Because I'm glad so that I'm you excited. are, I'm glad that you are paying for that class because that's what we mean. You are giving back to that culture and that heritage by taking with a source practitioner i almost didn't do it because i was like i'm not i'm that's not i'm not trying to do that work but i do want to do begin on here and educate people about it and say well here's why i think you might want to rethink that or here's somebody else you can talk to and here's yes. why the, and they have they offer it for a reason they want you to learn they want to teach you so that you know better um it's just when people start trying to make money off of culture, cultural practices that are not their own. That's when they have to be especially mindful and careful um, because then yeah. the, yeah, the, the consumerism and commercialism takes over and then it bastardizes the practice. And that's not just in witchcraft or spiritual practice dance too. And I learned that the hard way. I did that at one point. Me too. Mm -hmm. What brings you the most joy in your practice? Empower. When I get students from dance or people from the audience that come to watch me, because I, my, my practice a lot is very, I'm performing it. I am trying to inspire through entertainment. And when I have people come up and tell me that they feel empowered, they feel inspired, um, when I have people in our group even say it sometimes because I do also join the group and uh, subscribe because I give a little fire dance performance every every week when I practice. Um, but anyway, when I hear someone in the group, anyone in any setting where I've shared movement, dance, empowerment through that, that through entertainment, when they come up and say they feel good, it made them feel inspired. That is that's when I know I've done my job and, and, uh, that is my favorite part 
is just feeling it in their face, feeling it, you know, in, in how they're talking to me, how it's seeing it in their eyes and their excitement and they're ready to try something new or not even try what I'm doing, but they just feel so much empowered in what it is they do. And that, you know, that is my favorite thing in the whole wide world, because that's the whole point of what I'm trying to do with my magic. You're so nice, Arlena. I like you a lot. I like you too. What is your favorite tool? It does not have to be a physical thing. It can be a thought or a class or whatever, anything. Definitely my favorite tool because it feels like a second extension of my body and it helps to really rope in that inspiration and take people's breath away is my fire poi. I have several uh, fire fire props. I have fans, little fans, big fans. I have palm torches, but the poi are what I am my most comfortable with and they do feel like extensions of my body. So um, those are my favorite. Plus I don't just use them for cool tricks and entertainment. Um, they, the fire is a cleansing for me and it is the way, one of the ways I send out, um, prayer and energy. I think of myself as a giant candle. Um, and it's how I address Hecate and it's how I praise the moon. Uh, so my poi feeling like a part of my body, uh, feels like my favorite and most powerful tool. I like it. (laughs) <laughs> what is something you wish was discussed more in the witch community uh cultural appropriation i told you i would say it several more times cultural appropriation cultural appropriation i wish that it was i know that it's being talked about in the witch community but i wish that it would be talked about even more because i come from the dance community where it blew wide open and it is still constantly being discussed um it's just so helpful you cannot do good you cannot do the good you think you're doing if you're causing harm even if it's unintentional uh if you're causing harm due to ignorance so cultural appropriation for sure is something that i wish would be discussed more and how to find ways around it because i think people think oh well witchcraft or dance it's for everybody it is we're not telling you not to do it or to stop we're asking you to be mindful and like you're doing where you're going to a class to learn more um, from source practitioners so that you don't cause harm, so that you can give back, uh, and so that you can call out when things are being used in a harmful way. Um, we're just asking people to educate themselves, invest in their craft, and in investing in their craft, they will give back to the communities of source practitioners um, to learn and do better. So no one's asking you not to do something. We're asking you to learn so that you do it in a safe way and a mindful way. Think about the three biggest influences on your practice. It doesn't have to be a person. It could, like dance itself can be an influence fire um some philosophy you read about once what are they and what are you thanking them for as far as influence so definitely my great grandmother blasa who blessed me with the capability to interact with my spirit guides um a a strong capability movement because that is a big part of my magic with or without the fire. It's really about the movement and the movement of, so uh, there's a quote that you actually, that I made a long time ago that you put on a necklace for me. Um, And it's, this is how I connect um, with my soul. And the quote is, um, dance is the way I write love letters to my body. No, dance is the way my soul writes love letters to my body. So the movement from my body is how my soul is connecting to the earth and is connecting to the energy and to everyone around me and my space. So movement would be the second one. 
And then the third one is my little familiar, my Bowser the Schnauzer Bolding, uh, who I truly believe was a gift from my ancestors and really is my familiar. She made I remember me a better when you first got you. She's so freaking <laughs> little and cute. <laughs> she is. She really, I knew I liked animals and dogs, but I got her and now I want to rescue. I have now have four dogs. I rescued two of them. Um, it really, really opened my heart more to, um, um, to caring more about animals in general. Like not even just caring, like really fucking loving animals dogs specifically i mean we there are so many humans that do not deserve dogs dogs are magic no other animal is going to love us the way dogs love us i mean love us to pieces so um she made me that next level dog lover and i wait do you does this happen to you like when you look in the face of everybody else's animals not just dogs you see a little bit of your dog in there or your animal yeah yeah. Yes. That, yeah. Like I can't relate to people who are talking about their children because I will be the one that's like, <laughs> my dog does something the same way, <laughs> and then I'm everybody the gets same. mad. <laughs> the same. I am exactly that's not the, the same. same at all. Okay. <laughs> You're not the same at all. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Boo. <laughs> what advice do you have for new witches? Uh, my advice for new witches would be to practice with caution. Um, again, the mindfulness. We think that um, there are a lot of spiritual practitioners and people with third eye gifts. And just because they have gifts does not make them good people. Uh, there's a lot of really shitty people with high capabilities as well tapped into their third eye. So you need to be careful. And um, you don't want to, you want to be careful who you allow to do any kind of practices on you, even if it's just readings, uh, you know, Reiki, any kind of spiritual healing, like make sure that person is highly, if you don't know them personally, or they don't come highly recommended by someone you love and is close to you, like you need to do your homework and be very, very careful. Take baby steps in who you learn from, how you're learning, always stay curious and all like even if you get to the level where yeah every you're making money and people are coming from all over to to you have a following they're coming to learn from you you still have a lot to learn we will always have a lot to learn especially especially as we try to be as ethically and authentically ourselves as possible um then you're going to have to keep learning and keep being willing to make changes where necessary um so Always be the student and take baby steps and practice with caution and mindfulness. Who do you think I should have on the show? More Chicana witches. And so I had originally just thought more Chicana witches. And I'm like, well, what the fuck does that mean? I have a few local witches I love. I don't know that you'll be able to get them on the show, but um, just off the top of my head, they're one of my favorite practitioners. I don't even necessarily know that she calls herself a witch, but she is a curandera um, and an incredible writer, incredible writer. They are studying her Chicana books all in, in colleges all over the U.S. Her name is Gris Munoz. The, um, there's another witch here who I look up to and I adore, but I think she's a little shy. Her name is Laura Meow. She's a great witch. There's a girl here that has a shop and I also participate in her monthly markets at this beautiful park. She goes by Deddy Page. Um, her, her name is Michelle and she, uh, is also a witch. Um, and, and, gives space for other witches to sell their crafts. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so those are just a few of them, but just in general, more Chicana witches. Uh, yeah. Chicanix. I shouldn't even say Chicana. Chicanix witches. Chicano and Chicana on Chicanix. Yeah. So I want to remind everybody that I am a um, Wonder Bread mayonnaise sandwich. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know. I don't have direct contacts with people 
who, I mean, I generally, I have a very small circle because um, I'm an antisocial weirdo. So if you have someone that you want to hear answer these questions, email me and or email them because I want them on the show. I just don't know who they are. I do look. I am looking. But I'm not very good at it. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you follow Kim, she posts it pretty often that she is open to guests and suggestions of guests. Is there anything else you wanted to bring up? Do you have anything happening that you're going to be appearing at? Do you have any sales coming up? Or do you have any questions that you wanted to ask me? Wow. Well, um, I do have a huge burlesque event that I'm actually producing coming up July 13th here in El Paso. It is our Celestial Bodies uh, burlesque show. Uh, I am part of a collective of burlesque dancers called Burlesque on the Rio. And we put on these shows quarterly, but these big shows where we bring big famous people from out of town only happen once or twice a year. Um, so I will be having that at my favorite place in town, touch bar. Um, and also, um, also, um, I will be part of a two Saturday in a row, witch event, uh, witness a witch event in El Paso as well, June 22nd and the 29th, I'll be fire dancing and vending. And there'll be lots of other witch inspired, um, stuff going on. They're going to be doing vignettes, of famous witch plays as well as other entertainment so that's going to be cool um but i'm always up to something or performing around town so if you're in the area ever if you give my page a follow at instagram uh, is probably the best most effective one and that is at darlena marie 915 all one word um then you can stay caught up on what it is I'm up to. And if you're passing through town or you're from here, you can plan to attend one of those events and also shop my jewelry on there as well. If you want some of my jewelry creations. And, um, I had a thing to ask you, Kim, and I don't remember what it was. Just blurt it out any, anytime you remember it. <laughs> okay. That's fine. So the last two things I ask of, ask of my guests are, number one, please recommend something to the listeners that does not have to be witch-related. Um, I recommend to the listeners to um, start your day every day. This sounds so generic, but it's really true. Dancing around. Fucking dance around. Pick your favorite song of the day and fucking dance around to it. No one's looking at you. No one is looking at you. Dance around. It's so good for your circulation on top of your spirit and your mental health. Fucking pick your favorite song. My songs vary every single day. Do I feel like twerking one day? Do I feel like doing a nice slow snaky song? Do I feel like doing a cumbia? It doesn't matter. Dance around your fucking room before you get in the shower to start your morning. It will change your life. I promise. The last thing is please tell me a story. Oh, a story. I had one. What's my story? So, um, I, w I had a funny story and I don't know what I did with it. Okay. So, okay. I will tell you the story of how I met my husband. How about that? Oh, okay. Because this, he laughs at me all the time because he's like, this was your witchcraft. This was your brujeria. <laughs> and it might have been, I did put it out to the universe unknowingly. So when I met my husband, I was 20 years old. I was a little goofy raver girl working at the mall. And he was a manager at a store in the mall at Journeys, actually. And his friend, <laughs> I worked in a little kiosk that sold knockoff purses. And he would have not come over at all had his good friend not been working at the Altel, remember Altel, the Altel kiosk next to me. <laughs> and I'm sitting there with my bestie back, this is still one of my besties, Brittany. She was waiting for me. We used to, she used to sit on the floor at the mall and wait for me to close up and then we'd go to the, a rave or something. <laughs> so she's sitting there waiting and uh, Jason is walking towards us and I swear it was like an 80s montage slow motion where there's sparkles wind blowing through his hair <laughs> um, you know some romantic song in the background was playing I mean I just 
I laid eyes on him and I've never done this before. I actually never wanted to get married uh, until I met him. And I still won't get married if, if anything were to happen and I, it, we don't stay married. I'm fine. I, my whole life I wanted to just stay a single gal. Uh, and I saw him and I just gasped and I told my friend Brittany, that's the man I'm going to marry someday. What the that hell? Was the first thing I said when I, the first time I saw him. Yes, ma'am. And Brittany was like, shut up. And I said, that's him. That's the man I'm going to marry. And, um, it was a long road. I mean, he was, he was with someone else at the time. His, his my friend <laughs> at the booth next to me introduced me and he was very much like, whatever, like, oh, hi, nice to meet you. I couldn't stop. Every time he passed by after that, I swear I drooled a little and he didn't even breathe in my direction. But five years later, I was 25 years old and in my prime banging body, uh, curvy and all <laughs> nice and flat, all the right places and nice and small and all the right places. And I was hosting a karaoke show for two years and I got to like make fun of the singers and play music videos in between them. Like it was a whole thing. And all these guys would always try to buy me drinks and stuff. And uh, in he walked and he was some of our regulars. He was best friends with some of our regulars. And I was like, oh, my gosh, it's the guy from the mall. But <laughs> I was playing it real cool because I was my hot self. And he came up to me and he was like, hey, because uh, I look different now. Okay, I'm not in my little raver shoes anymore. Like, And he's like, I remember you. You remember me? And in my head, I was like, oh, yeah, you're the guy from the mall. But on the outside, I was like, yeah, I think I remember you. You used to work at the mall, right? Like all. So we dated cool. on and off from there. Then we dated. So we spent a year just kind of dating casually on and off and dating other people, even though I knew he was the one I was going to marry. And I would tell my mom that all the time. And my mom didn't like him at first. She loves him now, but um, my mom didn't like him at first. And so she was like, he would he would go to the karaoke shows from there, but he would be giving his number out to other girls and stuff like that. And my mom would sit there fuming and because I would always tell her, look, that's the guy I'm going to marry. I would tell people, like not everyone, <laughs> but people close to me, like, that's him. That's the guy I'm going to marry. He just doesn't know it yet. That's what I would say to people. And my mom would that time dude would like, hitting on that girl. <laughs> yes. My mom was like, that prick. She used the word prick. That prick is giving his number to someone. I'm like, that's he's not my boyfriend yet, mom. It's fine. I told her he'll come around. And I remember she even told me, Miha, there's not somebody else. Like, I just don't know if this guy's that into you. And I'm like, he just doesn't know yet, mom. So casually we dated on and off for about a year. Then I put my foot down and was like, he was just kind of like trying to be cool guy. And I was like, fuck you. I love you. And you're stupid one time. And then he was like, we broke up for like three days and he came back and was the best boyfriend ever proposed to me a year later. And we just celebrated our 13 year wedding anniversary a couple days ago. So yeah, Yay, you won. I won. I guess the universe <laughs> paid attention. But the first thing I said when I saw him was that was the guy I was going to marry someday. That is it was, hilarious. Yeah. It made and for interesting. A wedding. Oh yeah. Yeah. How funny for Brittany, my best friend, who saw it all yeah. unfold in front of her eyes to this day. Yeah. And he is the great, he is such a great husband. He never gives me grief about whatever magical unicorn, glittery, naked shenanigans I'm up to. He's, he just lets me do my thing. And we're so different because he's all I've sports, never met him. white guy sports. What? Yes, you have. No. Yes, we were married. No. What, Kim? No. Oh my goodness. Unless he came to any of your dance things that I was there, but I don't think I've ever met him in person. I think that's why I thought you did because he did. Um, I don't make him come to anything, everything now, only the big important things because I have so many performances all the time. But yeah, we're complete opposites. He is super white guy into sport. I do not like sports whatsoever. Sports are his thing. If there was, if there, if he had magic, it would be sports, sports, everything. <laughs> So he's big time sports guy, not into the arts whatsoever. So we are very opposite, but man, do we work. And I love being married to him. Yay. Yay. So that's my funny story. Sorry, it was long. <laughs> well, thank you for being on the show with me. Yay. Yay. Finally I love you. you. I love you. Okay, everybody go immediately and go follow 
Darlene and Marie 915 on Instagram. Yes, please. Yes. Go do it. All one word. Mm-hmm. And okay, I'll see you on Instagram and I'll see you, Darlene R. Marco. Okay, bye. Darlene, welcome back to Hive House because you already live here. Yay! I'm back. I'm back. You thought I was gone, but I'm back. Mm, mm, buzz, buzz, motherfucker. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh. Say one. Long belly dance for side feet, but I was not actually stripping. I did not strip down to pasties for my very first time until March of this year, until a few months ago. And I had the time of my life and the audience was so receptive and wonderful and everyone was excited. I was excited. That shit was fun as fuck. It really was. Uh, In fact, uh, back to the recommendation portion, if you can strip down to pasties at any point, whether it's in your own bedroom or for an audience at Amateur Night, fucking do it. It's so (laughs) To hear more of the members only episode, head over to crepuscularconjuration.com. The monthly magic tier will give you access to the monthly magic Marco Polo group, the private Facebook group, and access to the written monthly spells. There's also Crepuscular Conjurations giving you bonus podcast episodes, coloring pages, guided meditations, spellcrafting videos, printable downloads, and a lot more. The free witchy wonderment level will give you a little sample of everything I just mentioned. You can also visit my shop, Clever Kim's Curios, to get spell boxes one at a time or by monthly subscription, intentional handcrafted jewelry that I make especially for witches, and handmade altar tools. You can even listen to the full Your Average Witch podcast library, including show notes and transcripts. Check it out at crepuscularconjuration.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of Your Average Witch. You can find us all around the internet on Instagram at Your Average Witch Podcast. Facebook.com slash groups slash Hive House at www.youraveragewitch.com and at your favorite podcast service. If you'd like to recommend someone for the podcast, like to be on it yourself, or if you'd like to advertise on the podcast, send an email to youraveragewitchpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next Tuesday.